So again, Minister, you're very, very welcome. So I'd like to introduce you and ask you to address us. It's uh, Malcolm Noonan, Minister of State for Heritage and Electoral Reform in the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. So it's over to you, Minister. Thanks, Declan, and uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, just to say that the privilege is, and is all mine. I think I'm a huge fan of the work of Irish Wall Towns Network for many years, having been a member of our own City Wall Steering Committee in Kilkenny for a, a long time as a member of the local authority, and seeing uh, firsthand the support that the IWTN and the Heritage Council had given to, to our city in um, interpreting and and conserving both the below ground and above ground uh, remains of uh, uh, elements of our uh, city's uh, uh, wall, uh, wall town defences. Um, and since 2005, the Heritage Council through the IWTN has been working to unite and coordinate efforts of local authorities and community groups uh, uh, in the management and conservation of historic wall towns across the country. The only thing constant for all wall towns in Ireland is change shifting demographics and lifestyles, the increase in commuting to, for work, online shopping, climate change and biodiversity loss all present challenges that require insightful responses. By advocating for heritage-led regeneration and through the sensitive conservation, reuse and promotion of heritage, the IWTN works to assist member towns in becoming more socially and economically robust in the challenge of change. The Heritage Council and the IWTN recognise the social and economic circumstances of our member towns. Accordingly, as, as detailed in the IWTN Action Plan 2020-23, the central objective is to help Ireland's wall towns become great places in which to live, work and visit. The central objective mirrors the government policy of town centres first and is now critically important to the task of rebuilding communities and urban centres post-pandemic. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, we will continue uh, within our work in Heritage heritage to advocate for this heritage-led generation approach. We think it's vitally important that the stories of our towns of our uh, 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 is told through that heritage-led approach. And I think that's why the IWTN will be central to what we're trying to achieve over the next number of years. Through the IWTN grants program, along with workshops, advisory documents and training events, the network has been working to develop heritage-led regeneration in member towns, as well as train and empower community groups to recognize, protect, and promote the heritage assets of their towns. Recently, I, I attended a traditional building skills workshop, which was also organized by the Heritage Council. And I believe that the drive and commitment to encouraging young people to enter conservation profession in tandem with grants programs such as IWTN scheme are likely to, to, to be a key part of the success of heritage led regeneration. And in those discussions, we had a, a lot of conversations about the, the notion of, of uh, putting in um, apprentices on projects, uh, bo both uh, through IWTN projects, but also other conservation grant schemes that are led through our department. We think it's a, a really vital part of this entire approach around uh, promoting um, traditional building skills on a, on a much more strategic level. Despite the challenges posed by COVID, the 2020 IWTN grants program funded a range of conservation and interpretation projects in a, a number of towns across the country with a budget of some 313,000 euro. The department was able to increase the IWTN monies for the Heritage Council during 2020 due to the July stimulus program. Uh, six wall, uh, wall town conservation projects were undertaken at Talbot Tower in Kilkenny, one I'm very familiar with myself, a, a really wonderful, wonderful project uh, at Lone, Limerick, Rindoon in, in County Roscommon, and two in County Tipperary conser uh, County conservation management plans were completed for the Tulsil in Carlingford and Kells Town Walls, and an ecological plan was produced for Ormond Castle Park in Carrick on Shore. Numerous interpretation projects and online events were funded in a number of towns across the country, including virtual medieval events at Athlone Rye, Loch Ray, Athlone and Cork City, interpretive booklets, Panels and brochures were produced for Carrick Fergus, Athen Rye, Loch Ray, Buttevant, and Galway City, as well as videos celebrating the development of Derry and the Wall City and the archaeological excavations at Black Friary in Trim in County Meath. This diverse range of projects highlights the many different ways to preserve, promote, and protect the heritage of our wall towns. The completion of projects in very challenging circumstances is testament to the enthusiasm and determination of many heritage professionals involved, as well as the commitment from network members. The workshop today will highlight some of the projects that 
were funded last year and perhaps provide inspiration for grant eligible projects for 2021. As I've already mentioned, the IWTN was founded 16 years ago and that the, fact, the fact that the network is not still in the existence but is thriving is testament to all involved, especially local community groups and local authorities. I'm delighted to launch the IWT grants program for 2021. I know this fund of 250,000 will help to safeguard and promote the incredible heritage that can be found in our historic urban centres and will increase the resilience of our towns as they recover post-COVID in years to come. I know too that uh, the really good document produced by the Heritage Council a number of years ago around the economic value of Ireland's historic environment presents that economic rationale for investment and around maximising the contribution of Ireland's historic environment uh, to, to uh, lead towards the nation's economic, sustainable economic development. I and my officials look forward to working with the Heritage Council and IWTN members uh, by supporting new projects and initiatives focused on preserving and promoting the walled towns of Ireland. I want to wish you all the very best with your deliberations this morning, with your AGM and with the workshop that we have ahead. Uh, I do hope um, that once we ease our way out of this uh, current pandemic and that we move hopefully towards uh, an opening up of, of society over the next number of months, that I might be able to get to visit some of your projects uh, over, the, over the, the summer and into the autumn and even into the winter. But uh, again, I just want to wish you all the very best with today's proceedings, Gore Margaret. Good that we're appreciated. I think it should be noted, some of the members may not be aware, but uh, since 2007, uh, some 7 million has been allocated to the uh, IWTN for the conservation of walled towns. And indeed, a further million has been given for community festivals. So can I assure you that we're very appreciative of the continued support of government to the work of the committee. And again, as you mentioned yourself, the fact that we're all volunteers in this area, I think as well is a tribute to, to the communities uh, up and down the country. But again, I appreciate your time and it's a great privilege to have you with us for as long as, as, as you can stay with us this morning. Could I now introduce Virginia Tehan, who is Chief Executive Officer of the Heritage Council, who will give a brief address again to the members. Virginia, and thank you again, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Declan. Um, good morning, Minister and colleagues. It's great to be with you again. I remember with fondness we met this time last year at Collins Barracks for the same workshop. And hopefully, as the Minister says, we'll be able to meet maybe before the end of this calendar year in one of the walled town sites across Ireland. I'd like to particularly thank the Minister for his support and for his personal commitment to this project and indeed to the Heritage Council. Without the support of the Minister and colleagues in the Department of Heritage and indeed the Department of Housing, the Heritage Council would not be in the strong position in which it finds itself today to be able to grow our support for heritage projects and indeed for community engagement with heritage. Both are deeply interlinked. The Chairman Del Declan just mentioned there that everybody here is a volunteer, including Declan himself, who very kindly volunteers um, his time and his experience as a former chief executive of a local authority to oversee our work on the delivery of this program. But I want to say to you that we greatly appreciate your own inputs, your time, and particularly your ideas and your passion and your commitment for your sense of place. And if we have learned anything over the past number of months, we have learned very clearly at the Heritage Council that Irish people value their place, their sense of commitment to place, of exploration, of reimagining where they live has grown exponentially in the past number of months. And that is because circumstances have forced people into an unusual situation where they must really re-explore and re-examine where they're from. And this has resulted in a very healthy, positive interest in our localities, in our natural heritage, our built heritage, and the history of a place, the folklore and the traditions. Project work that we're doing in other Heritage Council projects around heritage in schools, whereby school children are engaging with video work to just explore outside their front door, their doorstep, what's on their doorstep, 
This month, they're looking at snowdrops and crocuses. They're looking at the changing nature of the biodiversity in their landscape. And next month, they will look at the flowers and bud. And they will also do heritage projects and history projects around their place. We also see through our survey of the heritage sector that those who are involved in the business of heritage, quite naturally, they're stressed and they're worried. And with Minister's support, we have put in place grant schemes to provide support to those heritage businesses. But all of you, all of you, the people who, who make um, our country and our heritage so rich are increasing your engagement with heritage. And we really appreciate that. And we particularly appreciate your involvement with the Wall Towns Network. Irish Wall Towns are a very rich part of the fabric of the landscape of Irish history. Their preservation was neglected for years. It's a great credit to Ian and to colleagues back in Kilkenny in the headquarters. You see a glimpse of our beautiful building behind me here, that they took the initiative and invested their own energy in growing, in initiating and growing this project because it really matters. The preservation of the history of Wall Towns and the physical remains on the ground and the wider uh, social history and political history associated with those towns is really important in an Irish and a European context. So I'd like to finish by congratulating all of you on all your achievements. I'm very pleased that we have 250,000 euros to award to this year's uh, grant programmes and I wish you all the very best of luck and look forward to visiting again the towns, hopefully before the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, um, Virginia. And can I at this point, in case it escapes me later on, but to acknowledge the work that Ian Doyle and Roisin Burke have put into, into organising this, um, F, um, this seminar today or this webinar today. So again, thank you for your contributions today. Uh, we'll now kick on uh, with uh, our first of our, the contributions to the workshop from Claire Lee, who is an executive planner in Tipperary County Council. And Claire is going to talk to us about the Carrick and Shore uh, Town Walls Conservation Project. So if Claire can come in, um, Gary. Thank you, Declan. Great. Um, I'm going to share my screen here now, Gary. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Should work away. Now, can everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be asked to speak here today. Um, as Minister Noonan said, we're one of six conservation programs in the in in the county are in the country this year in Carrick and Shore. So it, it was a privilege to, to be asked to talk about it. So I'll proceed on. If I can get my presentation, there we go. Okay. So Carrick and Shore, um, I suppose a lot of us think about Carrick and Shore as, as the town for association with cyclists and Sean Kelly and the, the Tour de France, but it's got a lot more to offer. It, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful town on, on the, the banks of the River Shore. It's originally a Norman town founded by the Butlers, and it has great historical amenity and presence in Ireland. But it, it's it's it hasn't achieved, I suppose, its potential. It, it, it's definitely a town that that needs help in, in terms of regeneration and building on its assets. So I'm going to just talk about heritage led regeneration and, and how I suppose the, 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 the town has evolved over the last few years with the help of the Irish Wall Town Network. So it's one of four wall towns. We've seven wall towns in the county, but we've four in the Irish Wall Towns Network, which, which is great. Um, in 2013, the at conservation management and interpretation plan was produced for the town. And this was a collaborative project. It was, the, the plan was produced with leader funding and that was sought by the Carrick and Shore Tourism and Development Association and work, working with the, the, the Carrick and Shore Town Council at the time. So the plan was produced in 2013 13, and then the council joined the, the Irish Wall Town Network in 2014. So what's interesting about the, the town wall remains in Carrick and Shore is there's not much left, but there is a significant section 
and it's very strategically located beside the Ormond Castle Park in the Ormond Castle Quarter in Carrick and Shore. So I don't know if you're aware of the lovely Ormond Castle, but it's a beautiful amenity in the town. So straight away, the, the steering group and the council saw the potential of, of the, 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 the town wall, the network, uh, in terms of regeneration and a bigger picture in terms of public awareness. So in terms of the conservation program itself then, so the conservation program really has been extended since, since 2013 to 2020. Works commenced in 2014 when we received our first conservation grant from the Heritage Council. In terms of the management of that, I'm lucky in that I'm a, a staff member of Tipperary County Council. I'm not a vol volunteer like yourself, Declan, and, and, and a lot of our speakers. So I, I have a certain amount of my time provided towards working on, on the wall towns in Tipperary. So I worked myself with the steering group in, in, the, in the, the management and conservation program. What's interesting about Carrick is that because we have other wall towns in the network, we were able to take a joint approach with other conservation projects. So I'd often work with the steering group to have a, a single contractor that would work on two wall towns. So we might have had works in, in Cashel and Carrick and Shure in, in any number of years. So it made better value for money in having a single con contractor and conservation architect. We very much took a, a phased approach. Each year we identified what works we do the next year and, and you use that knowledge to seek funding for the next year and, and build towards a final completion of works based on a phasing. So we, we, we understood that we'd never get the works done in one year. You have to phase it over, over a number of years and be prepared for your next work for the next year. Think like that. In terms of funding then, the, 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 the program is managed by the planning section in the council and they have their own budget for conservation. So they, they co-fund with, with the Heritage Council for works. And where possible, the council has been active in seeking funding from other sources as well. For example, last year, we received funding from the HSC for some conservation works in Cashel, as they own the section of wall in Cashel on which works were done. And where other opportunities we would have, we would have sought support and funding. Um, in terms of landowners, this was seen as a very important part of the management of the walls. The, the walls are very much co-owned in, in all our towns. They, they're, they're, they're owned by, they're, some of them are in public areas, some, are there, some of them are in private areas. So landowner collaboration was constant throughout the process. And the district municipal district would have done a lot of help with us on managing the landowners and talking to them and contacting and keeping details. And finally then, each year we undertook procurement to seek a, external expertise in terms of a conservation architect and a contractor. We did this fresh every year because I suppose every year we, we had a different budget, a different plan of works, and it was, it was more effective to do it this way. So for challenges then, in Carrick and Shore, our main challenge really was the fact that the wall, the section of wall to be maintained was in, in an extreme state of fragility. It, it hadn't had works on it for many, many years. And it really, it was a section of wall that was protected due to the fact that it's located beside tennis courts and the park in Carrick and Shore. So it really was just left there. It was it sat, sat there for, for a long time before works, before it came to, I suppose, the attention of the community it, it, after we prepared the conservation and management plan. So it, it was in a poor state of repair. You can see a picture there, if I can move my cursor. This is a crane that was put on site early one morning with the dawn to take down this huge lime tree. I see that lime tree was probably about 150 years old and it was about to fall really on top of the walls. And it was the first job to be done in 2014. There was two trees actually we had to take out. So that was the initial works. And you can see the supports there as well. In 2014, when we took the vegetation off the walls, we found that they were so fragile that we couldn't complete the works that year. We didn't have sufficient funding. So we had to stabilize them over the winter, putting in big supports and, and we sought funding the next year and successfully received it from the Heritage Council and we were able to finish that. The, the bottom picture there is a collapse. I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. And the, the other challenge and opportunities were our people and I suppose how we get everyone on board and how we ensure that the local people understand what the wall town is and where they are and what they mean for the community and the form of the town. 
Um, Declan mentioned this, that it, it, it's really awareness of local people is, is a very important thing when, when you're doing regeneration and conservation in a town. So that, that, that's a key point. So our interpretation program. So the steering group was always very keen on interpretation and communication for our, our program of conservation. And it's also a requirement of the Heritage Council of Grants as well that, that, a that an interpretation program is in place. So this was something that was assisted, the planning section I suppose was very active in this as well, as well as the community, the group. One of the big outcomes that came from Carrick and Shure was our Solving Our Own Problems weekend seminar held in 2016 and supported and organized by the Irish Wall Town Network. So this event was, was organized to allow locals, local people, local community groups, um, tourism and business associations to meet with mentors from all over the country to talk about elements of the town that were important for future development. We had David Fitzsimons from Retail Excellence Ireland, Simon Wall from Westport, Dave O'Connor from DIT talking about traffic and transport, Paddy Matthews from Fall to Ireland who spoke about tourism destination development and Grania Shaffrey who spoke about using heritage in intelligently in a town. This was very, attend very well attended. We had an event during the night and we had walks the next day around the town with each of the mentors, with, with people split into groups. And the final output of this was a publication which set out the vision for the town in terms of regeneration. And we still very much use this and it has been very instrumental actually in where we're going with Carrick and Shore for the future for, for inter heritage led interpretation. Other publications that have featured articles on the, the Carrick and Shore walls are the, the Butler Society annual journal. The Butler Society is very important just because Carrick and Shore is a Butler town on the Butler Trail. They've, they've supported and, and helped, I suppose, with this. And we, we also have published our conservation plan on, on the council website and issue it and use it whenever we're doing preparing documents on the town. So that the, the fact that the, the town is a wall town is never forgotten. It's an important aspect. Lectures have been a feature of the, 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 the overall Wall Towns programme in, 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 in Tipperary. I'm always available to give a lecture. I, I've spoken many times at weekends and, and night times in all the towns on, on the Wall Towns and you know people find it very interesting. They're always fascinated. Social media, we use our, our own planning section Twitter account to feature the Wall Towns regularly. We've carried out school visits to the Walls um, I've done a radio interview with, as have some of the steering group members and festivals and events. We have members of the events organizers when they were happening last year and the year before who sit on the steering group and where possible, we would integrate the wall town heritage and, and the legends of the towns into festival programs. So just some images here from our, our publicity interpretation programs. Um, our Twitter page there, we have uh, a bunch of young men from one of the schools in Carrick and Shore having a look at the walls. They're always fascinated. They like the, the blood and gore legends of the town and Cromwell and, and all that sort of thing. They're fascinated by that. So it, it's great to have them on the day. So just I'm going to speak very briefly about the, the conservation project 2020 for Carrick and Shore. So I have outlined the location of the works that we concentrated on for the for last year. It's quite a long section of wall located just to the north of the tennis courts and to the west of the Ormond Castle Park. So it's quite a long section that we, we carried out works on. It was it was about 40 meters. Again, extremely poor condition. Our consultant for the year was David Kelly and Associates from from I, I'm sorry, from from Yall. And our contractor was Gloss Engineering. They were both procured early last year. It was a very challenging project this year, last year, because the, actually the day before we went to tender for our contractor, the, the section of the wall, a large section of it actually collapsed. We got a phone call the, the next morning from a, a landowner telling us. So in fairness to uh, David Kelly and Associates, they rewrote the tender at very short notice and we got it out. But obviously it had to include a rebuild at, instead of just a, you know, a, a conservation project. So it completely changed 
And thankfully, we were able to procure some additional funding from the Heritage Council very generously, which allowed us to, to carry on and do the works that we had originally planned as well as rebuilding. And last year, we had, as I said, we had a giant project with Cashel on works up at the HSE owned site um, for the Cashel Town walls. So basically last year we, we had to make our collapse safe. We sorted our masonry and that section was rebuilt that had collapse. We had to install ties on either side of the breach. We repointed the boat faces and secured the parapet and wall walk. And really the works that were done last year have finished the conservation in Carrick and Shore. It, it, it's, it, it's really maintenance from now on and uh, keeping that section looking good. An image here and you really see how fragile the wall was it, it collapsed over the summer we knew the section was was unstable we had been monitoring it but we had hoped that we would have been able to conserve it before it, it did this on us but um no such luck the timing was incredible but the timing was good as well in that at least we were able to tackle it so this is the internal face of the walls after works you see the the tennis court it's a lovely backdrop for the for the public community down there there's a remnant of, of wall walk left there as well. And this is the external face. You can see the metal ties there to stabilize the wall and the section that was rebuilt. Um, our contractor was, were excellent stonemasons, um, brilliant work. You can see the quality of the work there. Another section there showing the, the ties stabilizing the wall. Okay, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit differently here now. Um, Minister Noonan spoke about heritage-led regeneration and potentials, um, the future regeneration of our towns in the country and, and where we're going. And I think this is a very, very important aspect of our, our walled town conservation program. Clearly the conservation program is, is a high value program in terms of conservation on its own, but it also has the potential to be part of a conservation plan and vision for a town. And where possible, we should be seeking a broader vision in terms of how it can fit into tourism and I suppose accessibility and urban regeneration as we, we do these projects. There's two projects here that I've mentioned in particular and Russian mentioned the the Ormond Castle Park e Ecological and Amenity Enhancement Scheme, sorry Virginia mentioned it. Um, this scheme is is at draft stage now, we have a, a design stage scheme done for an ecological and amenity enhancement scheme for the Ormond Castle Park. This park is beside the Ormond Castle and beside the town walls. And it, it was our interpretation element for last year for, for the conservation program. So we're, we're doing an enhancement scheme for the park. Our, our consultant is Nick de Young and Associates. We've carried out public consultation and our, our scheme plans are drawn up and, and, and ready now to go to part eight. So we're hoping to, to, to get planning permission in the next month or two and have this scheme completed. And it's a lovely high quality scheme that will enhance the park as a tourism and amenity asset for the town, but also from a biodiversity and ecological point of view. The second image there is from Feathered. And this is a park that was opened last year and developed through funding from the town and village renewal scheme and the Heritage Council from a point of view of the conservation of the walls. You can see to the to the left of the screen, to the right of the screen there, that that's the, the town wall itself. So this park was originally a derelict site. It was inaccessible. It was covered in muck and um, debris. And it was, a, a, we had a, a, a derelict building at the front of it on the streetscape. It's been developed into a high quality park now and a walkway. It, it, it adds to the circular walled walk in Feathered and it's a significant tourism asset adding to the town of Feathered and its walled towns. So I, I definitely encourage anyone to go and visit both of these, these parks. But both of these were envisaged and developed in, in consultation and collaboration with our, our conservation program. And I suppose the conservation program led to them because people got more aware of what could be done when they saw what, you know, people on site and works going ahead, it helped get people to think. And then looking at the much bigger picture then, so just referring back again to Minister Noonan and heritage led regeneration, this is a very important future for our, our wall towns. Carrick and Shore joined the network in 2013. At that stage, the town I suppose was suffering economic pressures like every town, but particularly Carrick and Shore was under a lot of pressure. 
the 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 fact that it joined the Irish Wall Town Network at the time, and um, we'd carried out its, its solving our own problems event. There was a lot of publicity. People got more aware of the potential of the town. Since then, as well, we've developed our Shore Blue Way, our Butler Trail. The Ormond Castle itself was was refurbished into 2016 by the OPW. And then since then, with collaboration with the, the Carrigan Shore Tourism and Development Association, funding was sought from the Rural Regeneration and Development Fund from the department, and we successfully received it last year. So we have over 450,000 this year to develop up a design scheme for the enhancement of the town. So the, the vision is to develop the, the Shure Blue Way into the town, bringing you right over to the Ormond Castle Quarter and enhancing the town centre and making it a much more visitor, high quality amenity space for visitors and tourists. So that's the kind of thinking I suppose we, we have to, to evolve to, to in the future for our towns. This scheme is going to public consultation very shortly. Um, we're actually meeting on it today, the steering group, and we're hoping to have our website live in the next week or two. So with that, I'm going to conclude and I'll be happy to take any questions. So I'll hand you back, Roisin. Thank you. Thank you, um, Claire. So uh, I think that presentation is most informative and I think it, it, it shows us the value of this network, the sharing of ideas, you know, the models of best practice. It's a template, as it were, for other places to follow, and it's very impressive. The methodical way in which that project, you know, was initiated and how it was carried through. Uh, I was thinking there, the fact that it could serve as a model for others, and there are no, numerous other examples, the same around the country. It shows you we could save a lot maybe on consultants' fees, you know, if we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. But again, thank you, Claire, and credit to you. So I'll now, we'll now go on to Marie Mannion, the Heritage Officer in Galway County Council. Marie had a very innovative project this year when uh, a lot of, um, of the activities in Galway were carried out virtually because of our, our because of the COVID. So uh, Gary, if you could um, link in with Marie and could I ask the speakers if they can to keep to the timetable so that we will finish as close as possible to the, the, to the end day, thank, or the end time, thank you. Um, good morning, uh, everybody, and uh, I'm just going to share my screen now. Sorry. Perfect, Jan, we can see that, Marie. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I suppose, sorry, just one second. Last year, uh, I suppose we were presented with a, um, a you know, kind of a, a new, a new normal, as everybody's saying, and we had to, um, I suppose, look at organising our festivals in a virtual way. We initially submitted our funding applications for Athenry Wall Town Day and Loch Ray Medieval Festival, as we normally would, but uh, we soon found out that that wasn't going to happen, so we had to think very quickly and put a programme in place. So we got our letter of offer from the Heritage Council and the Irish Wall Town Network on the 27th of May 2020. Um, the amount awarded for each grant was 5,500. Uh, we developed a theme for each event at the end of May once the uh, funding was confirmed. Um, the theme for Athen Rye was learning from our heritage and the theme for, for Loch Ray was learn, connect and celebrate. Um, both themes complemented the National Heritage Week theme and, um, you know, kind of where you had learning from our heritage. Um, so we had meetings then with uh, the committees uh, in uh, Athen Rye uh, Wall Town Day Committee and Loch Grey Medieval Festival Committee and um, my colleagues, uh, Alan Burgess, manager of Athen Rye Heritage Centre, uh, played a key role in Athen Rye, and Councillor Mogi Maher, chairperson of Loch Grey Medieval Festival Committee, uh, played a key role in the Loch Grey um, developing up the programme. So basically what we tried to do, we tried to, we had a, a good think about it and we tried to uh, figure out what we could do. So we looked at the amount of money we had and we thought we, you know, kind of we tried to, I suppose, build a program that would appeal to different sectors of the community. Uh, we looked at kind of, I suppose, um, heritage uh, kind of interest for the two towns. We also looked at uh, skills and crafts 
and we also looked at, I suppose, the education end. So we developed up two posters, you can see them there, um, to promote our events. And um, I suppose because the two towns are so close together, we have to make sure that our posters for both uh, ha reflect their own uniqueness. So you can see there uh, the Athen Rye one uh, uh, and Lockway. Then we had the, the uh, you can see that we put in the hurlers there for Lockway. Where you could have put them in for, for either, but anyway, um, so uh, it's and we decided then to kind of to host it on our online platform, which was the Galway Bio Facebook page. Um, so the work that we undertook then from June to August, I suppose it was really, really important to, to go and uh, to, to think it all out, but we identified the topics and the key messages that we wanted to be told. We chose heritage practitioners that could relate to the topic and kind of, I suppose, people that could get the message across in a very concise, animated and fun way. So it's really, really important. So, you know, kind of say we had to really think about who it was we were going to get and their strong points. But, you know, sometimes people are better say on one to one situations, that, you know, than maybe kind of speaking to camera or to, to video. So we had to factor all that in. Uh, we engaged with a graphic designer very early on to brand each event. And uh, we worked with Merchant Gate Films, GK Media, Digital Age 3, uh, Galway Bay FM radio station. That was extremely important, working with the radio station. On radio ads, we produced films, videos, and podcasts. So we had a whole mix of digital media. The other important thing was to look for bang for book. So for example, we got Martina Passman and John Flynn artists. So they created um, they created a series of, I suppose, um, images for us uh, and drawings. But we used those for our heritage booklets, and the etchings then were also used for, um, I suppose we use the etchings for our booklets. We use them for an online exhibition. We also use them for postcards. So the whole idea was that, you know, whatever you were getting done that you would, uh, the important thing was that, you know, you tried to use whatever you had that you'd get as much, uh, I suppose, value for money. Um, so then uh, I suppose a lot of time was given to viewing the various videos. That That's something that's really, really important that if you're going to go down this, uh, this road is that you have to give it a huge amount of time. It actually takes the same amount of time, if not more, to develop an online, um, an online, um, um, an online um, conference or an online event that, than it does a live one. So we had to look at changes. We had to we had issues as well in the sense that uh, from the council's perspective, we can't use we transfer or Dropbox. So then we had to think about how we could uh, how we could access this uh, all the the films and stuff. And the important thing was to, as well to have really good phones. Uh, we we found that our reliance on technology really. Uh, was 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 huge. We had to spend so much time getting getting up to speed on various uh, technologies, and to make the our phones were hugely important to us. Um, we promoted the event on social media, email listings, websites, the local radio station, and on heritageweek.ie. Heritage Week is really, really important because it gives you, it's free, and it gives you a huge amount of uh, publicity that you wouldn't otherwise get. And if you had to pay for it, it would be colossal. Um, we produced a promo video and that was extremely, extremely important. It's less than one minute, but it gives a flavor of kind of the, the, I suppose, the festivals and the events. So it was less than a minute, but it gave a whole flavor of what it was about. And they were viewed thousands and thousands of times. So really important thing to do is that little promo video. Um, we uploaded all our videos and films then to YouTube and Vimeo and then onto our websites. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that, in kind of, you know, setting up a YouTube channel, if you haven't uh, a YouTube channel, a Vimeo account. Um, so we uploaded previous work that we'd done previously to complement the additional information that we, the additional uh, films and videos. So we had children's heritage trails, we had photo galleries from previous years. So we looked at all the, all the resources we had going back from all the festivals in the previous years, and we integrated those and used them and pulled them all in together. So the very important thing as well is to vary your content. So you'll see here, we created a medieval newspaper 
And it's kind of funny, it, uh, because of Athenry and Lockery are so close to each other, uh, one pokes fun at the other. And it's just, and it also kind of takes cognizance of what was going on with COVID. So it's really, it's really kind of, you know, kind of a fun, engaging way. We got lots of people that really engaged with the uh, uh, the Athenry Medieval Times. You can see there the sketchings and the etchings, they were used in our uh, they were used as an online exhibition. We use them. We use them also uh, in promotion. Uh, we worked with Galway BFM then on podcasting. That was really, really important uh, because they carried uh, the few days before the online festivals. Galway BFM carried the podcast, and we found that the local radio, the amount of reaction we got from uh, working with the local radio was was huge. Like you would get lots and lots of phone calls, emails, um, you know, people wanting to engage because with people, you know, listen to local radio and it's really important. And to be honest, uh, the value we got from our local radio station was colossal. They, they went way beyond and above, gave us extra time slots. They knew we had very little money. So they worked with us and they promoted us constantly. So very important. Um, and the lessons learned then, uh, the importance of local radio because it generates a lot of interest, emails, etc. The uh, promo slots, the advertising on social media, very, very important as well. And we also got, uh, I suppose, the other thing is that we got a lot of, um, we got a lot of, uh, you know, kind of time on different shows and local news. Uh, the local newspapers as well, in our case, the kind of Tribune and the Trim Herald, absolutely colossally important because they give us a huge amount of um, uh, of free publicity as well. And you take so much time to commission, to deliver uh, the uh, videos, the films and the podcasts. Uh, give yourself at least four weeks to package your event. That's really, really important because you may think you're finished, but to be honest, the amount of times that it, the amount of time that you need to package it is absolutely huge. We premiered uh, the Lock Ray event on uh, Facebook, and we found that that was really, really good. And what you have to do there is you have to have a very strong introductory part, a very strong middle, and a very strong end, and to vary the content. So the premiere on Facebook, like that, led to thousands of views, and I would seriously recommend it. Uh, don't accept any content, uh, you know, if you're going to premiere less than 48 hours because uh, it can throw your whole, uh, I suppose, your packaging uh, of your festival and event. It can throw it, um, throw it all over the place. So just make sure that whatever you do, that uh, you have everything ready to go 48 hours beforehand. So as I said, the uh, premiere worked really well. Um, and we had, like, say, just even, you know, kind of in the first few days, we had 2,100 views. There was a reach of 4,648. And then, like, we had, say, for the Heritage Week, we had 12,404 views, so our reach. So the the like linking Facebook, your website and your social media is really, really important to try and get your message out. Um, and then festivals, virtual festivals are very costly. So for example, we spent 12,000 euro on Athen Rye Virtual Wall Town Day, and we spent around around 14,000 on Loch Ray Medieval Festival. So we did, going into this, we didn't know what the cost would be, but they are exactly the same as, if not more than staging a festival. So you need to give a lot of time and consideration into planning the event. You need to buy in tech expertise if you haven't got it. And I would seriously advise that. You, you need to consider the channels to be used for promoting. You also, uh, do you know, kind of where you're going to broadcast your event. And uh, so just even there now on our websites, uh, just even on the, the first, you know, the first hour of viewing, uh, we had 1,063 views and Loch Ray, we had 1,801 views. Um, so and up to the end of October, we had 36,105 views. So if you want to see our uh, virtual medieval festivals, there's tasters there. We can make this um, presentation available after and you can take a look at it. And um, I suppose the message is if you are going to run virtual events, they're extremely worthwhile and um, also as well to think that you have a legacy project because the information you have available on your website afterwards can be used for a myriad of reasons. So for example, uh, the In Athen Rye, the RRDF project is uh, looking at uh, ways 
a finding at the minute, and they found all the information that we'd made available for our virtual festival hugely, hugely beneficial, and it saved a lot of time and money. So what you're doing in creating uh, this, I suppose, all this content is you're leaving a huge legacy, but you have to think very carefully uh, about your budget, about what you want and what your legacy is going to be. So I'd like to thank the Irish Wall Town Network and the Heritage Council for funding these two events on behalf of Athenry Wall Town Day and Loch Ray Medieval Festival. Go Emil You can hear me. Uh, anyway, thank you, Marie, for a most interesting and, and um, a very wide ranging um, contribution. I think the work you did there is fantastic. I think it really is, it, it shows you the talent and the commitment that is available to us, you know, uh, but to put such work into it and not to give up, even though COVID was very, very difficult for everybody. I think what you did in Galway was tremendously encouraging and we're very much appreciative of it. So I'll go straight then to our next one. Gary is going to come in and talk to us now about um, uh, moving events online. I think as well, the archives that you have created, the, the legacy, Marie, is, is, is very, very worthwhile. So Gary, thanks. Thanks, Declan. So one second now, and hopefully you should all be able to So I'm going to be talking for the next 20 minutes uh, or quicker if I can on moving events online. And these are just pictures taken from the Loch Grey and the Athenry virtual festivals which took place during 2020. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with me, I'm involved in media for 20 years. I have two companies. I also produce podcasts, film reviews and business and marketing. I'm registered with Teaching Council of Ireland and I've worked with universities and PELC colleges and private businesses throughout the years. And this will be a list of some of the clients that we do be working with. So first rule, <laughs> uh, some people don't like this rule, but the first rule when it comes to having an event or organizing something that's dear to your heart is you have to realize one golden rule, and that is that nobody cares. And the reason why I say nobody cares is we often are in bubbles. You know, it's our nine to five. It's, it's what drives us, it's what gets us out of bed in the morning. It becomes our, our, our end all for everything. But the reality is we have to go back to the very basics and consider that nobody actually cares about our festival or our event, but we have to make them care about it. So don't assume that we ran a festival in person for so many years that people automatically be pulled and interested in actually attending it virtually. We have to put in as much effort as we did before. And when it comes to any sort of a virtual festival, internal communication is key. So it's so important that internal communication is cohesive and transparent and clear before you start communicating your message externally to the general public and so on. So when it comes to planning for moving your festival online, you gotta, I suppose, think about your schedule, your schedule of content as well, what it is that you're going to be putting up online. So you're, you're treating it exactly as you would have pre-COVID-19 times. And you got to think about your audience as well. Where are they? So I suppose before we were used to our audience coming to the location as such. Now we have to find our audience online. So where are they? Are they more on Facebook? Are they more on YouTube? Are they more on Twitter? Are they on LinkedIn? So we got to find out where they are and we got to find out when are they available online? When is the best time to reach out and publish content online for them? We can't just presume that uh, if we put something up at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning that they're going to watch it. So a little bit of research needs to be done first. And, you know, one of the best ways of doing that is going into your social media channels, for example, that work best and see where you're getting the most engagement by looking at uh, your measurement and analysis on the back end of your the stats that you are provided for free on these platforms. So I would always say, you know, moving a, a festival or an event online, still promote it as normally as you would have pre-COVID-19. So do release teasers about it, have promos, like Marie mentioned, the 60 second one, which works across all social media platforms, which is great because uh, most of them have time limits. Uh, consider creating a Facebook group because if someone's in a Facebook group, anything that's posted into that group, they will get a notification straight away. 
unlike just posting something up in your timeline where uh, it's only kind of the 25 people most engaging with your Facebook profile will see it. Consider Sorry, Gary, yeah. can, I, can I interrupt you? I don't know if other people have the same issue, but I'm still on your first page. The slides are not uh, moving on. I don't know if other people have the same issue. I have a photograph of a guy with, a, with a, an orange jacket moving events online and that's it, it's static. I think if, if you can make the slideshow full screen, Gary, that would be great. Yeah, same so now. I thought I had it full screen. Can you see it there? Yeah, perfect, yeah, that's All great. Right, thanks, perfect. Okay, um, thanks for that heads up, Declan. So yeah, you can uh, you can use videos as well for creating social media content uh, for your stories, your fleets, your reels. Uh, if you have any press releases going out, you can put a QR code, which is free to create, put it on your print media so people can scan it on your phone and it'll bring it to your Facebook page or your website or whatever. Again, radio is really, really good. The difference about, you know, traditional marketing is that there is a a loyalty creator. People will believe something quicker if they hear it on the radio or see it on TV or read it in a newspaper than they will regarding something popping up on social media. And there was a report yesterday where I think something like 85% of people said that they think social media influencers are actually quite fake and they don't fully believe them. Uh, you can consider releasing tickets through Eventbrite as well. Again, if the event is free, it's free to use Eventbrite. And it's a great way for people just to casually come across an event online and register for it. Um, you can also create a donate button on your Facebook page if you have one, if you're a nonprofit organization, uh, which might be an interesting way for those who need to raise funding alternative ways. And again, you can be publishing content on your website, Zoom, social media, um, and then consider as well putting a budget aside. Even the Arts Council recognize now that uh, people need to include in their budget funds to actually pay for the online advertising or promotion uh, of an event. So it's important as well to try and put funds aside for pushing and boosting it online. And then there's your influencers as well and guests and referrals you can look at and use the assets you are working on to develop blogs for your website, testimonials. Again, you can export the audio from a video and turn it into a podcast. There's so much you can do. And why video? I'm, I'm a big advocate of video and it's, you know, it's more engaging. People love to watch video. It builds trust and credibility. It's entertaining. People get to see the location you're talking about, get to hear the organizers, see them, get an idea of the sense of culture. Um, they hear the emphasis on things that are important. Important Music can be included to set the tone. And additionally, text can be coming up with maybe factual information about dates or funds or numbers, whatever. And it's easier for people to digest and retain that information when it's done in that style on video. And bear in mind, four times as many people would rather watch a video rather than read about it. And we're very much in a lazy generation now. The concentration level in the last 20 years has dropped from 12 seconds to eight seconds. So video is great for maintaining interest and stimulation of the viewer. Now, host your videos where your audience are. So again, you might love Twitter and not understand Facebook, but that doesn't mean that you should just be putting your content up on Twitter. You need to be putting your virtual festival up online where your audience is and where they're most drawn to. And of course, your website is 50 times more likely to appear on the first page of a search engine results page if it includes video. So ultimately, the whole idea of social media, which people uh, misinterpret, is it, it's to drive people to your website. So people often put more time into social media than they do into their website. But social media, it's supposed to be um, just an affiliate of your website. It's to drive traffic to your website. It's your virtual shop. It's what holds all the information, all the videos, all the blogs, uh, all the ways people can get in touch with you or read more articles and so on. So you need to be using social media to drive people ultimately to your website where they'll get all the information about your virtual festival, ideally where they could register for different events for your virtual festival, maybe look back at previous videos of the festival and so on. Social media stats in Ireland, as you can see, as of January this year, Facebook is still the most dominant social media channel in Ireland, but it's different. So if, I mean, if you're looking for an audience 
as well in America, you can see it's only got an influence of 60% of the population in the United States of America. So don't assume if a social media channel is very popular in Ireland, but you're trying to go global or you're trying to go North America, don't assume that it's the same trending social media platform as it is in Ireland. So it's just something to bear in mind there as well. They're different throughout. Again, looking quickly at social media compared to traditional marketing is traditional marketing, your newspaper, your radio, uh, a billboard. It was all one way. It was pushing out information to someone and hoping they'd react. Social media works as a two way conversation. So you need to engage with people who are talking to you. Uh, and it also gives you great measurements. You can put an advert out on radio and they get uh, their BAI uh, audience report every four months and it says oh x amount of people on average listen to that show over the four months whereas with social media you'll see how many people exactly saw what you put out how they reacted how long they watched the video and so on and just to bear in mind there are video length restrictions with various social media channels so facebook is four hour videos uh, it'll take max twitter the video has to be under two minutes 20 youtube it can be 12 hours instagram 60 seconds and so on. So just bear in mind that there are limitations with how long a video can be on the social media platform you choose to put it up on. Now, it's good if you have a YouTube uh, channel to make sure that your account is verified because by verifying your account, it allows videos to be longer than 15 minutes. You can also live stream via your YouTube channel and you can customize the thumbnails. So instead of YouTube picking some random image from your video and having that as your thumbnail, you can choose what the thumbnail is. So if you haven't got your YouTube account verified, do that because it gives you, and it costs nothing, gives you a lot more scope. When publishing videos online, there's hundreds of uh, video formats out there. They say MP4, MOV. I just tell people go to MP4 because it's the format that works across all social media platforms. So that's the video format you're always looking for. And then the question is, okay, do I pre-record videos and upload them or do I live stream or what do I do? So I took Facebook as an example and it's pretty much the same as well with YouTube, which would be the two main platforms if you're doing uh, videos in your virtual festival. So you can publish a video. Um, so that'd be a pre-recorded video. You publish it and it's gone live straight away. Or you can schedule the video. So you can say, I want the video to go live at 12 o'clock tomorrow and then it starts it goes live at 12 o'clock tomorrow and people can watch it whenever then there's a thing called premiere which came in in the last year and it's been a blessing for us with covid and with virtual festivals premiere is like a live stream but it's a pre-packaged video it's pre-recorded so it's not actually live but the beauty about it is it appears on facebook or youtube as a live stream so in other words i video today on my phone i edit it together Tonight, I upload it onto Facebook and I say, Facebook, premiere this video at 12 noon tomorrow. And then at 12 noon tomorrow, that video will start playing in real time. So in other words, no one can forward past it. Uh, if someone comes in at five past 12, they're seeing it five minutes in. So it's like popping into the late, late show on a Friday night. If you jump in at 20 to 10, you're seeing it from 20 to 10 onwards. So it's, that, it's a great new system that has been built in. And then you can also live stream as well if you just want to go live. Um, and we'll talk about the difficulties of that shortly. But here's an example. If you're uploading a video on Facebook, you put in your title, you put in your little uh, blurb what it's about, and then you can customize your thumbnail. So here you can, it, it will auto generate a thumbnail or you can select one, or you can go down here and add an image. Bear in mind, if you have an image, um, the text on the image can't be more than 20%, otherwise you can't boost your video. And if you go to this link on Facebook, it will um, allow you to check, do you go within the 20% text rule? Don't panic, I will be able to send these slides on afterwards as well. So that's an example of an image where 20% of the image is comprised of text. Anymore, they won't be able to boost the video. And here are the options then when you're on Facebook. You can publish now, you can premiere, schedule, you can backdate it. So you can, if you forgot to upload the video, you can backdate it to make it look like it did actually go up last week. Um, or you can save it as a draft if you're not sure when it's to go live. But premiere is what I would highly recommend. 
live streaming is another option. It's it's live, it's easy to do, it's popular. There's no editing involved, so there's a saving there cost-wise. It does create better engagement, but so many things can go wrong. You can lose the connection to your Wi-Fi. We might have come across that doing Zoom as it is. The batteries can go down in cameras, you get lights, camera issues, audio issues. You have to have zones where you're live streaming from called no video zones, where people can go and be guaranteed that they won't appear in the live stream. If you are live streaming, you have to have disclaimers there on entry and throughout saying that live streaming has taken place. There's also an issue with minors when live streaming and there's possible investment needed in hardware and software. So it's not a route I would recommend. But Courage, we're working with Courage this year, which is a literature festival in Galway, and it's running over four days. And what we're doing is we're recording material in Ashford Castle and a few other places. So there's going to be like four pre-records going out every day and four live streams from the Town Hall Theatre every day. So it'll be like a pre-record, then we go live. Then we have a pre-record, then we go live. So that's kind of the balance and that I think is the way it will be going uh, in 2021 and 2022. If you are videoing, there's different ways. You can use the DSLR camera, your smartphone, as Marie was talking about, or an actual camcorder. They're all good. But remember when you're doing a video, people buy into feelings, stories, authenticity. So be yourself. Don't try and be something else or someone else. The more truthful and transparent you come across, uh, the more people can relate to you. If you are shooting on your mobile phone, make sure it's in landscape orientation. So it's like that. Do consider getting uh, an iRig mic lav so you have a lapel mic on someone. They're not a huge amount of money and the audio quality will be much better because people will forgive poor video, but they won't forgive poor audio. They need to hear you. Uh, you can get your gimbals as well. They can be from 150 to 200 euro and they will allow you to stabilize your shot, which is really important. And of course, shoot in 1080p as a minimum. Uh, so you're in full HD. So on an iPhone, you'd go to your settings, you click on camera, and then you'd be looking for 1080p over here. Uh, so 1080p at 60 frames per second is a good default. Just take up a huge amount of space down here. You can see all the space that is taken up. So 1080p is what you're looking for. And on an Android phone, you go to your rear video in your camera settings and you look for same thing there, 1920, 1080. And that's the setting you're looking for. So you're at full HD. And of course, bring a cloth as well if you're filming on a smartphone because we have them in our hands all the time and we tend to get fingerprints on them. So make sure you wipe the lens before you start video. Important consideration as well as licensing and permissions. I've worked with organizations and I know of big organizations who have put huge amount of money into videos and then they didn't actually correctly go about getting a licensed music track so they would have just found an audio track on the internet or from a, from a CD that they had at home put it up with their video and then within a few hours the videos pulled down from Facebook or YouTube or the video might be completely muted or they might be kicked out of their social media channel for copyright infringement. So if you're including music in any of your videos, make sure you go about it correctly. So this is one website, for example, it's called Incomputech. It's free to use any of the music that's on this website. You just need to credit the person at the end of the video in your credit roll. And when you select the track, it'll give you exactly what text to paste. Or you can go about buying a music track where you have unlimited use worldwide and you're paying maybe $50 for one of them. YouTube have some free music that you can use as well if you're only uploading it on YouTube. Facebook also have in their creative, creative studio some music as well that you can use if you're just uploading it on Facebook. Remember Facebook and YouTube are competition with each other so don't think if you can put it on one you can also put it on the other if you use music from it. And always get consent forms signed. Um, it's just Better to have rather than assuming that everything will be fine. You don't know what humor uh, may change with someone over time. So a recap then, make people excited about your festival. Don't assume they're going to be excited. So put in the hard work for your online festival as much as you would have done for previous versions of it. Communication internally is key before you start communicating your message externally. And of course with online, it can get messy. So everyone just needs to know what they're at, know where your audience are. Uh, so know what channel is best to be putting your material up on. Promote just as hard as before. 
use video to your advantage. So again, there's evergreen marketing. So for instance, we shot stuff for Athen Ryan Lacquerie, but we also did a 60 second promo video by just taking short snippets from the finished products. You can take screenshots and use them as photographs. You can export the audio, use it as podcasts. You can turn it, transcribe the audio and turn it into blogs. There's so much you can do with video. And again, make sure it's shot in 1080p as a minimum to have it at good quality. It's MP4, the format that you put it up on so it works on social media and that the music, you have permission to use the music. Final rule, measure. At the end of the festival, measure everything. See how many people it reached. How many impressions did it make? What were the most popular posts you put up? What were the most popular videos? When were people engaging more than other times? So at, at least when you come back to possibly doing it next year, um, that you actually have a good template of what works and what doesn't work. So you're making more accurate decisions. And I think the future of festivals is actually going to be blended. I think it'll be both. I think people now will be looking for stuff to be online as well as in person. You look at the Glastonbury Festival as a quick example, it's a music festival, nothing got to do with heritage as such, but they actually sell out before they announce who's coming to the festival. And at the same time, they still show it live on TV. So people know they don't have to spend hundreds of euro for a ticket, they can watch it on TV, but they still go for the experience. So there'll be people who want the experience to go there and there'll be people who want to see it online. And by remaining online, you're reaching a wider audience, more viewers, and it tends to please the funders as well, because the more traction it's getting, the more it's worth people's investment in your festival. So Shine, that's it from me. Uh, thank you for your time and apologies for uh, not sharing the slides correctly at the start. That's fine. Thank you, Gary. Most informative a, a sign of the way things are going to be in the future. Uh, when I think of our, when I was at work and Honeywell Bull um, computers being introduced for the first time, we have gone a long, long way. I think was it Tomasi Griffin who said, Ni or Lehedi on a reach. Things will never be the same again. Um, again, very, mu very much thanks to you. So our next item then is a, a presentation by Roisin, uh, Roisin Burke on the 2020 uh, grants program. Roisin. Thanks, Declan. Um, I'll just put up the image here. Can everyone see that image there? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So uh, thanks very much, Declan, for that. And uh, also thanks so much to the Minister uh, for launching our 2021 grants programme. Uh, I'm really looking forward to working with uh, our towns to progress more projects, promoting, protecting um, the heritage of the walled towns over the next year. So I'm just going to briefly talk about the 2020 grants program. I know we've heard we've had some great presentations already from Claire and Marie about projects uh, that they carried out last year. So I'll just look at the overall grants program. So uh, we launched the 2020 grants program last year in uh, Collins Barracks on the 14th of February. Uh, it was a very different world to the one we're in right now. Um, and there was great interest in the grants program then. Little did we know what was just around the corner. COVID hit our shores in, in March and uh, things did change. The lockdown that, that came along caused a lot of difficulties uh, for grant applicants. We all had to get used to working remotely as well. So in response to this huge change, um, the IWTN application deadline was extended into April and the applications were assessed then and letters of offer were issued for the grants program um, by the end of May. All of the projects were completed by the end of November. And this infographic here uh, just details, I suppose, the different types of projects that were completed over the year. So as you may have heard, we had five conservation projects in Kilkenny, Athlone, Limerick, Rindoon, Kirk and Shore. We had vegetation removal from medieval uh, wall section in Feathered in Tipperary. And two conservation management plans were completed for the Thosal in Carlingford and the town walls in Kells. We uh, then for the interpretation and events grant stream, 
There was four virtual medieval festivals in Athenry, in Loch Ray, Athlone and Cork City. There was a reconstruction drawing of medieval Kildare completed, a heritage trail brochure for the medieval heritage of Galway City was completed, um, installation of interpretive panels uh, took place in Buttevant, two booklets, uh, one about the medieval heritage of Athenry, one about the medieval heritage of Loch Ray were published, and videos were produced for Trim in County Meath and uh, Derry, Derry Walls. We had an interpretive fit out of the guardroom in Kirk Fergus. Safety works were carried out at the Lone Castle. And as mentioned already by Claire, an ecological plan was uh, started and, and carried out for Ormond Castle Park in Carrick on Shore. So we had uh, to go back to, to the applications, I suppose, 14 conservation projects applied for the conservation stream of the grants. And eight of those were funded, which is 57% of projects. And the grants ranged from 1,500 euro uh, to 80,550 euro. We had 21 interpretation and virtual events projects applications, and 14 of those were funded, which is at 67%. The grants for that ranged from 1,500 euro to 12,000 uh, euro. Despite all the challenges that groups faced over the year, the projects were completed by the end of November and a total of 313,510 euro was spent uh, in grant funding for these projects. And I, I think it, it's fair to say the range of projects that you can see here on the infographic, it showcases all the different ways that uh, member towns are preserving and uh, protecting the heritage that they have. And I'd really like to say as well that the completion of projects in such difficult circumstances when uh, lockdowns were coming in and going and things were changing uh, very quickly is a real testament to the, all the heritage professionals involved in those projects. Um, so I'd just like to say congratulations to everyone who completed their projects last year. So our grant applications for 2021 are now open. The guidelines for these grants will be issued to all network members on Friday. And in the guidelines, there'll be information about the types of projects can be funded, the, the scoring of applications, uh, the timelines and the deadlines for applications as well. Um, but I would urge anybody to please do get in touch with me if you want to have a chat about any project ideas, if you want to talk about the application process, if there's any questions you have about the guidelines, be more than happy to chat to anybody about those. So give me a call or send me an email. The closing date for the applications is five o'clock on Wednesday, the 31st of March. And I know Amanda, who's going to be speaking uh, now with tips for the application process, she'll have more details about that. So I'd just like to say again, uh, congratulations to everybody who completed their projects last year. And I'm very much looking forward to, to working with member towns to progress other projects this year. And I'd really urge anybody to just get in touch with me to talk about projects or the application process. Thanks very much. Thanks, Roisin. Thanks. And again, congratulations and a big thank you to all the participants um, in, 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 in the programme. So now I'd ask Amanda, for our last session at this, at, in, in, in this, in this uh, part of the, the morning's activities, Amanda Ryan um, to talk to us about the, the grants for the current year. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks very much. Um, I just, sorry, apologies. I just, uh, sorry, video. Now, hello, thank you very much. I'm just going to uh, try and share, um, the presentation now, if I can. Is that coming up, Declan? Yes, well, I can, yes. You can see the presentation? I can, yes. Oh, good, good. Uh, sorry, I can't see it on my screen. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, so basically, I'm just going to uh, run through uh, some, just some advice and tips on making your application. And just listening to uh, the last few speakers, I think 
most of them actually provided really, really good advice and uh, the types of things that we are actually looking for um, specifically to in regards to the uh, digital events. But I'll just run through a few uh, bits with you now. So first of all, the key dates. Um, 31st of March, 5 p.m. is the closing date. Uh, the scheme, both schemes are open to uh, member groups, either local community groups or local authorities. For local community groups, you must have a valid bank account or credit union account in your name. Um, applications are made through our online grants system, uh, which is available on our website, the funding page of our website. Uh, the outcome in writing will be issued on the 10th of May, that's following our council board meeting. Uh, if you are successful, uh, for capital projects, you will have to be finished works uh, by the 19th of November. And for the interpretation and events, it's a slightly earlier deadline of the 15th of October. And unfortunately, we don't have flexibility on these dates. So any funds not claimed will be forfeit after those dates. So just some advice. Uh, biggest advice I could give and most important is please read the guidelines as Roisin said they'll be available on Friday and uh, it really is important to go down through the guidelines and know what you need in advance. Allow enough time to complete the application. The online system is live so it does time out so if you are in the middle of typing and you get a phone call please click save because when you come back the information that you've typed in won't have saved automatically. Uh, the four criteria that are set out in the guidance document of each scheme, respond, complete your application in response to those four assessment criteria because that's what your application will be scored on. And if that means doing up a document to directly answer those questions, do and upload it as a PDF. Public benefit is critical, obviously for the, most obviously for the interpretation, but also for the capital projects. Uh, for both, make sure it's well planned and show how it will make a difference to your area. Uh, do not be overly ambitious. Particularly, I say this uh, in relation to the capital works. Uh, the reason for a number of unsuccessful applications under this scheme last year was simply because they were too ambitious. If your project can be phased, phase it. Um, the funding for that scheme is 200,000. So as you can imagine, with capital works, that's quickly absorbed. So both schemes are very competitive, but in particular, the capital uh, strand. Uh, the assessors will be scoring your application on the information that's provided. We won't be looking for any more information, so don't assume that the assessors know your project or your town or your wall or your track record. So actually submit your application like it's your first application. You have to build the case uh, for funding. The application form itself is like a template, but feel free to include additional information as a, an uploaded document. You can upload as many documents as you like. They must be less than 10 megabytes in size and must be JPEG or PDF format. In the past, people have uploaded Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, and when assessors go to look at them, they don't open properly, they freeze. So please, for your own sake, uh, make sure it's either in PDF or JPEG format. And also, which is very helpful, is uh, use a file name that matches the actual document content. Uh, just to, to focus on the capital conservation projects, uh, include make sure you include a specification of works and, it's, and the just, justification for why these works need to be undertaken. Uh, in terms of the budget, you must show a minimum contribution of 10%. For local authorities, that has to be a monetary contribution. For voluntary community groups, that can be in the form of voluntary in-kind uh, contribution. It doesn't have to be monetary. 
But just to highlight, uh, if you are successful and you are a voluntary group, when it comes to final reporting stage, we will want to see where that 10% voluntary contribution came from. So keep that in mind. You will have to keep an account of hours and what you did as part of the project. Uh, very important uh, that you show some kind of evidence of where your figures in your budget came from. Um, I know some local authorities especially won't have gone out to tender, but uh, you should have some kind of evidence of where these figures came from, that they weren't plucked from the sky. Uh, include copies of relevant plans, surveys, audits. If you're referring to um, if the works are... Um, as a result of a recommendation from a conservation management plan, include the relevant excerpt or plan to show where this was highlighted. Uh, evidence of appropriate consultation, if letters of, of support are needed, include those letters from private owners, businesses, etc. please include. Uh, again, very important, appropriate approvals and permissions. If you have applied and you haven't secured the consent, uh, show us evidence that you've applied. Uh, can't emphasize how important this is. Clear, current, captioned photographs, assessors, love images. So please include as many as you can. Um, a map is also very beneficial as well. So just in terms of the interpretation of, and events, as Gary and um, Marie's uh, presentations uh, were, ver were actually uh, exactly, um, exactly correlated with what I'm about to say here, think digitally this year. A lot of the projects that we've offered funding to last year, obviously it was pre-COVID uh, regulations and they were actual events, physical in-person events. So people had to go back to the drawing board and come up with a virtual, virtual format. Um, but this year, obviously, think digitally. Uh, COVID is with us and will be with us for uh, quite a bit of 2021. So uh, where, tell us where you intend to host the digital resource, through which platforms or websites um, that your audience will have access to it. Do include a project out outline, like the user journey, samples of graphics, other visual content, dr content draft text, technical specifications. Give, st give us statistics of your social media platforms, how many users you have, uh, how many followers you have on Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Um, we want to see your online presence. Uh, digital projects, as Gary and Marie uh, said, show evidence that you're getting proper advice from a suitably, suitably qualified person. Um, again, copies of quotations or evidence uh, to show that it show evidence to support the figures in your budget line. Um, I concentrated mainly on the digital events for this year, but obviously there are other types of projects we do support under the interpretation and events. And there's further details of those in the guidelines. Also, with the Heritage Week <laughs> website, www.heritageweek.ie has lots of good tips and advice. So I would also suggest looking there for ideas. Um, and basically, if, if you experience any issues completing your application in line, please contact me straight away. Uh, these issues are probably very easy to deal with, but from our experience, people panic and they try to sort it out themselves, uh, especially towards the closing date. It can delay time. And if your application isn't submitted before five o'clock, we won't be able to accept it. So contact us straight away. As I said, more than likely, we'll be able to sort it out within a few minutes. And we wish you the best in your application. And as Roisin said, both Roisin and I are available if people need to contact us. I would be more about the kind of use using the online platform, uh, whereas Roisin would be able to offer more technical advice. Uh, but between us, 
we'd be delighted to help anyone that needs it. And also, as Roshan said, congratulations to everyone that completed their projects last year, a very difficult year, and everyone came in on time with enthusiasm, and it was fantastic to see these projects being realised. So thank you, Declan, and everyone. Thank you, Amanda, for your very informative um, presentation. What we intend to do now, folks, is that we will have a 10 minute break for coffee. Uh, and then we will resume. So what time is it now? It's 11.30, 11.29. If we resume at, say, 11.40. Uh, sorry, Declan, will we just will we have the questions first before we, we take the break? Will we do that? Whichever, yeah. OK, we'll, we, we'll take a question session. Have, have anybody, has anybody flagged that they want to ask a question, Roisin? Uh, I think we have one question from uh, Michael from Lockray. Okay, well then we'll take that. Uh, there's just a hand up there. Thanks, Declan, and thanks, Roisin. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Just great to see everybody today. Hope you're all keeping well and safe. Uh, thanks to all the presentators. Uh, I think they're all excellent and helpful. I think they'll help every town going forward. Um, but just in connection with our online video um, and the Loch Ray Medieval Festival, I have to single out Marie Mannion. I think the investment of the 14,000 that was invested in the films, the videos and the podcasts, uh, the return of having 40,000 views uh, across the world, technically, uh, it shows how popular this has gone. Um, and I think Gary mentioned the blended festivals going forward. I, I absolutely think that's right. But just thanks to Ian Dyle from the Heritage Council. Thanks to Roisin from the Irish Wall Town Network on behalf of La Prairie, because we couldn't run our festival without the grants. Um, but a massive, massive thanks to Marie Mannion, our Heritage Officer. Um, she'd done 99% of the work, and, and I'm not one bit afraid to say it. She deserves huge praise. I think the presentation she showed means that this um, festival could be ran in any town in Ireland. Um, and it just shows that, I suppose, when you do get 40,000 views, it shows the amount of uh, people that enjoy heritage and want to keep involved in heritage. So just to everybody, to yourself, Declan, thanks for um, hosting the meeting today. But thanks to everybody who's involved in Irish Town um, Networks. I think it's great that we keep our heritage alive and well in, in our counties. And, and I just wish everybody well and safe. And thanks for your opportunity. Michael, thanks. Thanks for those sentiments. I, it's appreciate, I absolutely agree. We have noted it at the committee level, the work that Marie has put into those virtual um, uh, festivals in Galway. Absolutely. Anybody else wants to uh, ask a question or comment at this point? Right, well, what we'll do is we will now break we we'll make a decision that we will actually take a, a 10 minute break. And if anybody in the meantime wants uh, to ask a question, if they can uh, send a, a message through the, the chat system to, to Roisin. Okay, so we will re, uh, we'll still stick to what, 11.40, 11.45. Uh, we will reassemble, uh, if that's okay. So thanks to everybody. You can now, we'll still hold this Zoom uh, link. We will just leave it, leave things as, as is. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Roisin.